Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Aware Athlete Show. I'm your host, Scott Forrester, and today's guest is Ashley Winchester, and Ashley is an endurance athlete and a guide. She's also a podcast host and a journalist. So, Ashley, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm just, it's great to have you. I'm, we're going to really enjoy this interview. So, let's get started with a little bit of background. Since you are an endurance athlete, I know that you grew up in a small town, I think Boonesville, Cal Northern California. Yeah, you, yeah. Yeah. Can you tell uh, us a little bit about how that influenced you, uh, you know, being in a small town, a little bit more open and Northern California is very beautiful. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Boonville is a is a small town, um, kind of on the northern California coast. It's nestled in a gorgeous valley called Anderson Valley, um, kind of more inland from uh, the ocean, but still get some of that coastal weather. Um, I grew up on a kind of a lot of acreage, and I realized how lucky I was now. <laughs> um, but when I was a kid, I thought everybody grew up that way. Um, but no. I, yeah, I, uh, I was able, my parents just kind of let me and my siblings run around, um, on this open wild land. Um, you know, we got to play and explore and, and learn a lot about ourselves. And so I was, I was introduced to just kind of being in the back country and, and being in nature and the wilderness at a very young age. Um, my mom would take us out and, you know, teach us about edible plants and poisonous plants and, um, you know, uh, survival skills and, and stuff like that. So I learned at a very long, young age, um, how to kind of navigate in the wilderness, um, and that definitely affected <laughs> what I do now as an endurance athlete, kind of going out and doing big solo adventures um, in the wilderness. Yeah. So how big was the acreage that you grew up on? Uh, we had about a thousand acres. Yeah. Yeah. That's startling. <laughs> Nobody has that anymore. Well, it's a lot. Yeah, we were really... very fortunate. We were very yeah. fortunate. Um, the, the land actually belonged to the company that my dad worked for, but we just lived on it. Um, so, and it definitely worked out in our favor. <laughs> yeah. So no worries. Uh, you knew when you were supposed to be back at home and, and you just went out and explored. Yeah. I, you know, we got ourselves into some hairy situations and uh, yeah. probably did some really stupid things, but we always made it home. And sometimes we would be you know, just covered in dirt and dust and mud and scratches. And my mom would, you know, spray us off at the hose in the front yard and, and yeah. you know, we'd go in and have dinner. So we always knew to be home before uh, dark. Yeah. So it's so important to make good decisions in the wilderness. And, and yet uh, any new adventure is a new adventure. It, it always has a few things we didn't expect. So as a kid, you, uh, how, how did that shape how you relate to both the dangers and, and the wisdom that you carry into the wilderness? Oh, I have a, I have a deep, deep respect for the wilderness and, and the inhabitants and the plants and animals. Um, where I grew up, because it was close to the coast, we had a lot of um, what I call pissed off plants, um, where, you know, they just, they have spikes, they sting like stinging nettle, there's blackberries, there's plants that will cut you when you walk by them. I mean, just like a lot of really angry plants out there. And, um, so I learned to really respect plants. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I take that going forward and especially when it comes to, you know, any kind of foraging or berries and plant identification and stuff like that. Um, I definitely take that, that into, into account, but, um, as far as, you know, like wildlife and, you know, I sort of learned what to do and, and what to expect when you encounter wildlife and, you know, the cautions to take. And, you know, I also learned that a lot of our fears that we have surrounding wildlife and being in the wilderness um, are pretty unfounded. Like it's, it's good to be afraid of predators, but I think that we're much more afraid of them than uh, we should be, or most people are. Yeah. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, as a kid, 
in that many acres in Northern California, did you encounter any bears? No, actually, we did have bears on the property. We saw signs of bears pretty frequently. Um, I remember seeing a bear once um, when I was a kid, but yeah, we they weren't around very often. And you know, we just had the the black bears in in Northern California, and they're pretty shy. Um, and I think that you know, I've always been kind of loud enough in the backcountry that I just scare them away before yeah before, i think yeah i think that's been my experience because if uh i have been in areas that had grizzly bears but i never saw any but everybody would would say hey there's a grizzly bear right you know right over by that lake or something but whenever i'd go around the corner i'd always you know do whoa or make some noise you know just to make sure that i didn't just walk around the corner and surprise anything yeah <laughs> definitely anyone, you know? Yeah, I, I learned that at a at a young age. And where I grew up, we actually have um, feral pigs, so hogs, um, out on the land, and they were actually scarier than anything else. Like they yeah. they were prone to attack, and so we you know we were taught to always keep an eye out for you know ways to get away from the wild pigs, right. um, which is kind of crazy to think about um, thinking about that now because my dad has actually been charged, um, by wild pigs and, um, it's, it's a scary situation. But, yeah. Yeah. For yeah. sure. Uh, you know, this might sound funny to some people, but I, when I, when I'm out in, in an area, it's national forest, it's, uh, even wilderness. Um, and I find a herd of cows. I, I give them their distance because if you're walking down a narrow trail and and you're following a herd of cattle. And if you should get in the middle of that and fall down, you're gonna get walked on and that's gonna hurt. There's no place to go. And, uh, and cattle amazingly are agile. They can, they can fly up a hill faster than you can. Absolutely, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, I actually, um, <laughs> so, when my brother and I were chased by a herd of cattle because the, they would lease out the land to, uh, ranchers sometimes. And so my brother and I were out and we were probably taunting them. I don't know. I don't remember exactly the events that led up to it, but they ended up chasing us. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm usually pretty cautious around the cows too. Yeah. I mean, anything that's bigger than me <laughs> that can, that could even step on me or anything, I'm, you know, I'm pretty yeah. careful with. Absolutely. But you, so you already said a, a word that I think uh, is so powerful. You said the word respect, and uh, I find that when we don't respect something, that's when the trouble comes. I fell off a roof once because I'd been on roofs for years, done all kinds of things with them, and this was only a 412 pitch roof, and I've had my weight balanced over a hip, and I was way down at the edge of the roof, but I had no fear of it at all, so I fell off. <laughs> And all the other situations, you know, much more dangerous roofs, I didn't fall off. But that one, no respect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. they call that in um, the, you know, outdoors world, they call that hubris. You know, it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a fallacy that a lot of people fall, fall into. And, um, you know, that, that idea of, well, I'm experienced or I'm, you know, like I know what I'm doing. And then you let your guard down. Yep. Yeah, that can that can quite easily happen. There's kind of a middle ground where you kind of get used to the fact that, you know, you can do something. And then there's that other place where <laughs> I can do anything. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so that, yeah, that's a powerful word and a good word to use. in the outdoors. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just I, I think it's important to, you know, respect the world around us and um, I mean, there's a, a lot that can happen out there. And I think having a respect and, and knowledge of the out of the spaces that you're moving through is is really important. And I think that's one way to stay safe out there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so the other aspect of that word respect might be. Uh, well, when you're out in nature, you respect the power it has to heal and restore too. So could you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I nature 
is an extremely powerful um, healer. I think I, I actually got out of an abusive relationship and the way that I found myself again was to go and spend a lot of time outside by myself. Um, and that's actually how I got into ultra distance running was because I would just go out and pretty much <laughs> run out my feelings. And it always helped me, um, kind of process and work through things, um, understand sort of myself a little bit more. Um, cause I feel like, especially when you spend a lot of time running in the outdoors, um, you know, that running and the, the pain and the, the challenge, um, starts to kind of peel away layers yeah. and being out there where you can be 100% yourself, let whatever feelings, thoughts, um, I mean, noises, you can talk to yourself, you can do whatever. And it just helps you to kind of, um, process things. And it, it was, the most important part of my journey and, and healing and recovering from, from all of that was spending time in the outdoors. Um, I, and I think it's, I think it's incredibly empowering when you do start to sort of push your limits a bit. And that's one of the things that I found in the mountains is that, you know, you, you prove to yourself that you can do these things, these incredibly challenging things. And it's really, it's empowering. Um, it boosts your confidence. It makes you feel like, oh, okay, if I can, if I can handle that, I can handle these other things in my life. Yeah. I think all of our experiences in life kind of add up and, and give us more, more oomph. <laughs> yeah. So to speak. But, uh, so that brings us to the fact that you have been called by some, some, uh, the queen of FKTs. And if anybody doesn't know that's fastest known times, and uh, that would explain some of the solo running, uh, because obviously if you enter a big race, you're not going to be doing it by yourself. But uh, so I love, I'm getting a little older, so I'm kind of slow, but I love being outdoors and I, and I love going at a pace that's both flowing and, ch and challenging, enlivening, I, I would call it. But, uh, and, and I feel like, uh, you know, you feel, more like an animal in some ways, if you can cover some ground out there and kind of be at home in it. And uh, so let's have a little history of your FKTs. And uh, I, you haven't done them all by yourself. Well, you, yeah, you pretty much do do the FKTs by yourself, don't you? Mostly, yeah, mostly. I, and I, that springs from, I like self-reliance. Um, I, I like to kind of, rely on myself and my navigational skills and my ability to, you know, overcome obstacles and, and stuff like that. I feel like it's a little bit more powerful of an experience. Um, I also, you know, get to move at my own pace and, you know, yeah. I don't have to, you know, take care of anybody if something were to go wrong, um, besides myself, you know, I'm, I'm solely responsible for myself in those situations. And I, I there's something about the solo aspect that I, I just, really, really enjoy. And I think that might stem from, you know, just, uh, my years of, of running solo to kind of, you know, deal with those feelings and, and situations from my past. And, um, you know, I still just really love being out there alone. Um, but yeah, so I've done a few with some other people and I've actually got some coming up that I plan on partnering up for with some other really amazing female athletes. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And then um, I've done a few with my boyfriend who is Jason Hardrath and he has, he's the first person to reach hundred FKTs. Um, he now has 107 or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of, kind of ridiculous, but um yeah, so kind of been along for the ride with with that as well. Yeah, so yeah, uh, I know some people who have done a hundred hundreds, but uh, a hundred FKTs—that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's so, pretty pretty amazing. So, how do you pick your F to FKTs? You do not necessarily say I'm going to set an FKT on something that's already been set several times by some of the best 
best triathletes in the world? Do you try to find a unique one? Or in other words, I, uh, would you ever plan to set an FKT on the PCT? Oh, the PCT. That one, so people ask about that a lot. Um, the PCT is, is something that I would consider um, down the line. It's a really, really big commitment. And I would definitely need some uh, support like financial support. <laughs> um, cause you know, that's, that's kind of a, a really big deal. And the, um, so the men's FKT on the PCT was just recently broken, um, this last summer. And, um, I think yeah. he got it down to like 52 or 53 days. Yeah. And, you know, even though that's insanely fast for the PCT, that's still a chunk of time. Um, so yeah, I mean, the PCT is something that I would consider. Um, I'm actually looking at doing sections of the PCT right now that are FKTs. Um, but when it comes to like choosing an FKT, it just kind of depends on weather. And, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a freelancer. I don't have to be anywhere at any specific time. So I can kind of, uh, travel. And if, I, if there's an FKT, you know, in, in Utah and the weather's good there, but the weather, the weather's horrible here in Oregon, um, I'll go down to Utah and, <laughs> and go yeah. play in the desert for yeah. a while. Um, and so, you know, with, with my schedule being super flexible and my boyfriend's schedule, um, he's a school teacher. So he has, you know, big chunks of time off. We'll just go travel and we'll follow good weather and just kind of go explore areas that, um, you know, either already have FKTs established, um, that we can go take from somebody or, um, you know, establish new FKTs. Yeah. So what is, has been your most challenging FKT and what has been your favorite one? Ooh, that's a really good question because I've done 53. Well, I've, it's, I've done more than 53, but I've, been able to claim 53 of them, if that makes sense. I failed on a, a lot more. Um, but so the most challenging FKT is actually one that I've tried twice and haven't gotten, and I plan on going back. Um, it's called the Death Valley Crossing, and it's about 165 miles of off trail travel, solo and unsupported. Um, pretty much down the length of Death Valley. So you go from the northernmost point to the southernmost point, and it is 100% off trail. It is through some really unforgiving, desolate terrain, um, really challenging conditions. And I have failed that one twice um, because of water issues. And there's no potable water in Death Valley. So you have to carry all of your water that you need for 165 miles from start to finish. And, um, you know, when you're the first time I did it, I carried about 15 liters of water, six, 15 or 16 and, um, ran pretty much ran out of water. Um, and so I had to bail out. And then the second time I did it, I actually had 20 liters of water. I was on a good pace and I got rained on, like it stormed like crazy. And so I ended up bailing because of mud conditions and, and stuff like that. And, you know, that amount of weight, when you're carrying it for that long, it really wears on your body. Um, 40 pretty pounds quickly. of water. Yeah. I think my pack, um, on my second go was like 55 pounds, um, because I did throw extra gear and it was supposed to be cold and it was supposed to be rainy. And so I threw extra gear in. Um, and so, yeah, I think I ended up being 55 or 60 pounds. Yeah. So, you, so you had 40 pounds of water and 15 pounds of food and gear. Is that, yeah. yeah. That's not too much food. Yeah. 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 yeah Cause you're looking at, you know, when you're, when 165 miles through the desert is not that far, if you have resupplies, it would be really easy, um, to run that as a supported or self-supported effort but because it's unsupported, you're moving a lot slower with that much weight on you. And so, you know, you're looking at six or seven days is what most people have taken to complete it. Um, you know, I'm, I want to go for like five days, <laughs> yeah. um, and really blow the record out of the water. Um, but it's, it's a really challenging, really challenging route. Yeah. I, I've never, uh, kind of dreamed of carrying 40 pounds of water before. <laughs> but yeah. that makes absolute sense. 
That's your most challenging one. That's the most challenging one. Yeah. And then my favorite, that's, oh, that's really hard to say because I've done so many in different areas. Like, you know, I've gone from desert to, to snowy mountains and, you know, there's scrambling and there's just flat, fast running. And so it's, it's hard to choose one specific, uh, favorite, but the first one that comes to mind right now is, um, actually also in death Valley. Um, it's call it's telescope peak. So you climb telescope peak from shorty's well and shorty's well is, uh, this like historic point in the Badwater basin. And so you pretty much go from, um, like negative 260 feet below sea level to over 11,000 feet to the summit of telescope peak. And it's one continuous climb. Um, you start going up, uh, you know, from, from the basin. So you're kind of on these like rocky, um, you're on a rocky, uh, gravel road to start. You go up into this Canyon and then you're pretty much off trail for, for some time. And you, you know, you climb up through, I think it's like five different ecosystems on the way up because you go from the desert to the Alpine. Um, and you know, there's a bunch of off trail navigation and then you, you follow this ridge line and up to the summit trail, which you meet up with up on the summit ridge and then to the peak and then all the way back down. And one of the reasons that one is my favorite is because, um, well, it took me two tries to do it. And the first time, um, I encountered some really gnarly snow conditions up high on, on telescope peak, um, and then got way behind record pace. And then, you know, the sun started setting and I ended up having to go down in the dark. Um, and that was a bit demoralizing because I, um, it was just, it was so difficult and it was so hard on the body, um, that I, you know, the next time going back, I felt like I had to prove to myself that I could do it. Um, and even that, that was a rough go. <laughs> it was a, it was a really challenging, um, outing, but it was probably the most climbing that I had done in, in one continuous go, um, that I, that I've ever done. And then, um, you know, just the distance, it's like 34 miles round trip. And so, yeah, it was, it was, it proved, I proved to myself, um, that I was capable of doing a lot more than I thought I could. Um, so yeah, that one definitely stands out. Um, and then another one that really stands out is the Joshua tree double traverse. So Joshua tree national park, um, you go across the park one way and then turn around and come back and it's 74 miles. And that was the first time I'd run anything over 50 miles. Um, and so I proved to myself, um, that I could, you know, run longer distances purely by just taking on that, that record. Yeah. And uh, how many, how long did it take you to do the first one you're describing where you ascended to uh, 11,000 feet? Ooh, um, I don't remember exactly what my time was, but I, I want to say that it was around the 14 hour mark. Um, I'd have to, I'd have to look it up. It's been a couple of years since I've done that one. So, um, I don't remember the time off the top of my head. Okay. So, so you often take those heavy packs then. Um, I tend to go for longer distance things. Um, I, I'm attracted to, um, longer distance, you know, through hiking type efforts, um, and then shortening that into like a, a continuous push. And so, yeah, I, I do like, you know, kind of, I don't, I don't want to say that I like carrying heavy packs, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I do enjoy the challenge. Yeah. So when you choose a new challenge like that, now you already know you can do quite a few things here, but, uh, uh, let's, let's talk about, uh, briefly about Aconagua. That mountain is what, uh, it is 22,800 feet, something like that. Yeah. I, I guess the exact uh, height is disputed a little bit from a foot here or there, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It, but yeah, it's, it's around 22,800 feet. Um, Aconcagua is the tallest mountain in the America, in the Americas. Um, and it's one of the seven summits. It's 
a non-technical peak, which means that you don't have any technical rock climbing or mountaineering um, that you have to do unless, you know, there's some crazy ice conditions up there. Um, the mountain's known for wind and extreme cold. Um, and it is much, much, much more challenging than it appears on a map. Um, a lot of people go into it and they're like, oh, it's just a hike up. Um, but it is, it is very, very difficult. <laughs> yeah, I, I know you went partly as a guide on that. And there are a lot of uh, base camps and people that are guided up that mountain sometimes. But uh, what is the intimidation factor for you? What do you feel when you're choosing a goal like that or, or something nobody's ever done before, an FKT? Uh, in other words, if you get the FKT, nobody's ever done that before, <laughs> recorded at least. But what's the intimidation factor when you choose a goal? Are you just like, oh, this would be a neat goal, not too worried about it? Or, or what, what is the challenge? What is the emotional challenge for you that you feel before you actually do it? Um, I mean, there's, there's always a lot of, you know, there's some fear and a lot of uncertainty when you go into th something that you've never done before. And with Aconcagua, yes, I, you know, I went as a guide, I was the assistant guide. Um, and I, the most intimidating thing for me about that was the elevation. I had never been up at those elevations before. And so I was, you know, worried about high altitude pulmonary edema and cerebral yeah. edema. Um, I was just worried about not being able to perform my duties as a guide, um, you know, because of, because of altitude and, um, you know, of course, worried about the cold. We, we ended up in a blizzard at one point up there. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of, uh, intimidation that comes along with, you know, these big challenges and, you know, I've, I've been so nervous going into things before that I've almost turned around. Like I've almost quit, um, multiple, multiple things. Yeah. Um, what I, I like to prove to myself that I'm capable of doing things. And there's always this kind of curiosity that's there for me. Um, you know, pursuing these things, like, what am I capable of doing? What am I, how far can I push my body? How far can I push my mind? Um, and also, a, like general curiosity of, you know, what's around the next corner? What's, you know, what is the section going to be like? What is it going to be like to have to scramble up you know, this third or fourth class, um, yeah. rock or, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of questions there. And, and I've learned that instead of letting those things intimidate me, um, to the point of fear, I try and be curious about them. And so, yeah, there's, and I do think that, you know, there's not a lot in life worth pursuing unless it does give you some, some fear. Um, you know, the, I think that, it's important to learn to kind of push through and manage that. Um, and honestly, you know, some of my greatest adventures have been the ones that I've been most afraid of. Um, yeah. yeah. When you get done, it's very life affirming. Yeah. I, I did hear you use the uh, word I failed at this or that several times. And that can be uh, a difficult uh, Another word, I'm, just for lack of a better word at the moment, I'll say that can be a harmful word to use on yourself. Uh, yeah, I, I've actually, um, I've thought about failure a lot. And that's one of those things, I actually did a whole podcast about it on my, on my podcast with um, a guest, Sunny Stroer. And we, so I don't see fear as a negative or failure as a negative thing. Yeah. Um, I think that I have, thought about it enough that I've kind of changed, um, you know, the value and meaning of the word in my own mind. Um, a lot of people see failure as a negative, like, you know, you failed, you're done, you're worthless, you're not good enough. You know, there's all these negative feelings that come along with, with the word failure. Um, when I talk about failure, I I don't see it as a negative. I think that every time we fail at something or don't succeed at what we set out to do, um, that there's a lot to learn in those moments. Um, if you're willing to dig into them, if you're willing to kind of, you know, 
set your feelings aside, dig into it, unearth some things, see what, you know, why, why did the outcome happen the way it did? Like, are there things that you can change? Do you, you know, is there a better way to do this? Um, what can I learn about myself as a human? Um, you know, there's, there's so many lessons within failure, um, that I, I don't, I don't think it's a bad thing. Yeah. It's a matter of semantics. I could tell when you used it, the word that you were using it in a very limited sense, just, I failed to meet this time. And, uh, I did not sense that you were saying I was a failure. And, uh, yeah. So, and you used the word learning. I cannot, uh, the person who did this and I, I'm, Diana Nyad, do you know who that is? I, I feel like the name's familiar, but I'm not sure. She is a swimmer who had as her goal to swim from Cuba to Florida. And it took her five times to do that in a good portion of her life because there was so much to learn. Yeah, so when you use that, you, you know what you mean by the word, but sometimes other people don't know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but uh, so she had to learn how to handle the jellyfish because if you didn't learn that, you couldn't do it. And she had to learn to have a team that really understood the currents and when it was time to go and on and on. She had to learn exactly what kind of wetsuit to wear. And, you know, because if you didn't learn that, you weren't going to make it. All, all these things, they had to come together over a lifetime of experience. And it wasn't possible to do it without learning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I honestly think that curiosity plays a huge role in that. You know, if, if you're curious, you're more willing to learn. You're more open to the lessons, I think, that are there. Um, and I think that the curiosity can kind of drive the... Um, that tenacity, you know, if you try something and you, you, you know, didn't succeed because of, you know, jellyfish or something like that, it would be really easy to be like the jellyfish are nasty. I'm not going to deal with this, but yeah. you know, to get curious and kind of go, okay, but, but so how yeah. do I deal with this? Is there a way to deal with this? Yeah, um, exactly. How can, and, how can we reshape my suit and my face mask or whatever, you know, to keep them out or yeah. Yeah. And the curiosity can drive, you know, not just the tenacity, but the, the innovation, you know, um, changing things, trying new things. Um, you know, that's, that's huge. Yeah. Innovation. Well, you're using all these great words. You must be a writer. <laughs> I'm a writer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I but, like uh, words. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, Dick Fosbury. I do not. You do not. He, because you're too young. But I think it's in 68 or 64 or something, probably 68. He won the gold medal in the Olympics in high jumping. But he had called himself the worst high jumper in Oregon. And uh, have you heard of the Fosbury flop? I think I have heard of that, yeah. At that time, everybody in the world pretty much was approaching the bar, bar from the front and doing this scissors movement and going over the bar. Well, because he was curious and because things weren't working for him that way, he tried moving his body in different ways. And finally, he ended up with a way of going over the bar where he went over the bar backwards. Shoulders, and his shoulders and head landed on the, on the padding. And then you kick the legs up. And then later it was, uh, people were, tell, were laughing at him and telling him that he was doing it wrong, but he won the gold medal. And, and now everybody does it that way. Innovation, yeah. Yeah, rather than saying, I'm just the worst high jumper in Oregon, he began to say, you know, how could I do that a little bit different so it felt better for me? Yeah, beautiful story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and then on top of that, you know, ignoring the the naysayers, ignoring the people who are judging you. Um, yeah. Because, I, I mean, that deters a lot of people. Um, and, you know, that goes back to, the whole failure thing where failure is seen as a negative because people are embarrassed by it. Um, and you know, a lot of times I think people don't try things because they're worried about being embarrassed about not yeah. doing well. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, I think, 
you know, the curiosity, innovation, um, you know, ignoring the, <laughs> ignoring the naysayers, all important things. I, I think we cannot do without the benefit of nature. But uh, the things that you're talking about there, uh, that's what we're really, really looking for. You know, the life affirming, the challenging, the growth aspects, the rest is just detail. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Uh, so tell me about getting uh, COVID on Okanagan. Yeah, so we, I, it's interesting because there are requirements in order to even get onto the mountain. Um, you have to pass health checkpoints. You have to take uh, COVID tests before going up the mountain. And I mean, I took, before even traveling to Argentina, I took I did four COVID tests to make sure I was negative for travel and to enter the country. And then um, once we were there, we had one more COVID test before going up onto the mountain, like the, the day before, pretty much going up on the mountain because that's required. Um, yeah, I don't know if you heard about the the issue with COVID at uh, on Everest at the Everest Base Camp and you know people getting life lighted out and... <laughs> Um, quarantining and, and all of that is really challenging at that elevation. So, you know, the, the, the Aconcagua base camp is considered the second largest base camp in the world next to um, Everest base camp. And so the, the people who run the park there, they, they really wanted to try and not have COVID up on the mountain and have a replay of, you know, the Everest base camp COVID thing. Well, because COVID is sneaky and you can have false negatives and you can test negative when you actually, you know, or you can have it and not show symptoms and test negative, but, you know, still have it. Um, COVID ended up making its way up to base camp. And um, we were actually up at camp two, which is at 18,300 feet. Um, we were, we were all feeling pretty okay. Um, and then we all started kind of showing weird signs and, and symptoms that were easy, really easy to pass off as, um, just altitude sickness. Um, you know, a cough, a sore throat, runny noses, you know, we had congestion, um, not being able to sleep very well. We, <laughs> you know, we had some GI symptoms, like all of those things were easy to kind of go, okay, well, you know, it's really dry, cold air. Yeah. Or, you know, our, our lungs are going to be irritated. Our throats are going to be irritated. Um, it's high altitude, you know, like appetite's not very good. Um, you know, a little cough. Yeah. That happens to me every single time I, I get into the Alpine. Um, and, you know, GI symptoms, you're, we're drinking this like mineralized water from the mountain. Um, yeah, of course, you know, that's, of course that'll happen. That that's normal. Um, but then as, as the days went by and we're, we're acclimating, we should be feeling better as we acclimatize to the altitude, but we started, everybody started feeling worse and worse and worse. My cough got so bad to the point that I actually injured um, the left side of my rib cage. And now it's been over four weeks, it's probably been five weeks since I, I was on the mountain and my ribs still hurt, um, just, just from coughing. And then, um, we, so we ended up, uh, three of us did attempt the, the summit out of five team members. Um, as guides, we made two of them stay behind just because, they were, they were not doing super well. Um, they weren't acclimating well enough to make a summit attempt. And so we actually, um, three of us attempted the summit. None of us made it. I turned around pretty early because my cough got really, really bad. Um, and then that day, um, you know, the, the other two, the lead guide and, and another one of our, um, team members, they made it to about 20,000 feet, I think, um, maybe a little above that and then turned around and came back, um, because they weren't feeling well. And we ended up calling over to climbing rangers who were at camp two 
at that time, they came over, took a look at us and pretty much said, nah, you guys, you, you guys can, you can go to the summit. You're fine. Um, and we were made to carry all of our stuff down from camp to, to base camp. Um, once we got to base camp, uh, we had the doctor there come and take a look at us. The first thing he did was run a COVID test on the sickest person in the group and it was positive. Um, and so, uh, you know, the assumption is that at that time, the rest of us are positive, um, because we're sharing small spaces, we're sharing food, we're sharing, you know, uh, all, uh tents, you know, it's, yeah. So we're, we're all very close and obviously like, yeah, it's assumed that we all had COVID. Yeah. Um, in my experience and, is really, really contagious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the two sickest members who we actually left behind when we, you know, did our summit attempt, they were helicoptered off the mountain from base camp that night. Um, as soon as they could get a helicopter in, they, they were helicoptered out because they were so sick. Um, which was kind of frustrating because, you know, we had just walked down from camp two with heavy gear. Um, you know, it was, really challenging. Everybody was totally wiped out even before starting that trek down. And, um, yeah, so it was, it was a little bit frustrating, um, you know, having to the climbing rangers kind of, uh, brush, it felt like we were brushed off a little bit. I think a lot of it had to do with, um, the language barrier there. Like uh, we didn't speak very much Spanish and they spoke zero English. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that definitely made it, made it challenging, but yeah. So two of our team members got helicoptered off the mountain from base camp. And then, uh, the three of us that were left, we stayed one night at base camp in quarantine and then had to hike out 15 miles the next day. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, had COVID before anybody knew about it and I was working in a health uh, care facility. Nobody knows what it is. I'm, I was just sick. So I called in and said, maybe I shouldn't come in. And they said, oh, can't you just come in? So I actually was at work spreading it around, not knowing, you know, that it was such a thing called COVID. And, but, so I did work through it, but I can't imagine, because I'd had a day or so off before, you know, before I went to work, but I can't imagine being at the height of that and trying to get off a mountain that I, I have been up to 14,000 feet. And at one point, uh, because I got a little dehydrated, I got some slight altitude sickness. So, you know, there you are up that much higher. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm also a little curious there because you have a lot of responsibility guiding other people and uh, HAPE um, and, you know, both both your heart and lungs circulatory system and, and your brain function and all of that are almost uh, more frightening at that altitude than COVID. So, you're not thinking it's COVID yet, but those other things, I, I thought to myself while you were talking that uh, perhaps that would have given you even more concern than, uh, you know, having COVID. Yeah. Uh, was, wasn't there a concern about uh, getting down to lower elevation, uh, especially since you're responsible for so many people a little sooner? For, for my sake or for, for their sakes? For both. Well, so uh, myself and, and the other guide, we're pretty experienced in the mountains. We're both uh, wilderness first responders. Um, we are pretty acutely aware of what HAPE and HACE look like. Um, and so with the symptoms that we had and the symptoms that you know we're going around the team none of that pointed to hate or yeah. face okay so um, i got you yeah and like yes i had a cough um but the the cough that i had was not it was not in line with you know other symptoms and um it, it wasn't really indicative of of hate and it was something yeah. that i was it was watching keenly, <laughs> you know, yeah. Hape and Hacer are always yeah. concerns at those elevations. Um, you know, there's never a guarantee that you won't get it. Um, 
But if even you if do, he's been up there before. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah. you didn't have swelling in the ankle. No, 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 no kind of edema. I, my cough was non-productive. Um, usually like with, with hape, it'll get worse when you lay down. Um, you know, there's just, there were a lot of things that were kind of like, yeah, I don't, it's not, it's not hape. Um, and nobody had symptoms of, of cerebral edema. Um, yeah. 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 I got it. <laughs> that makes sense. You, you have to use your rationality and kind of figure out these situations, yeah. Yeah, and that's part of our jobs as guides is to, you know, ask questions of the team. You know, we're, we're almost, it's almost annoying how much we check in with them because we ask them constantly, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Um, do you have a headache? You know, we ask very specific questions. Do you have a headache? Um, how is your appetite? Does your stomach feel funny? I mean, just, you know, we ask tons of questions all the time to, um, you know, keep track of our team and how they're feeling and, and what symptoms they may be having. And we make it very clear to everybody before even going up on the mountain that, you know, we will be asking a lot of questions. We need you to be very, very honest with us. Um, and if you're experiencing anything, headache, nausea, you know, anything like that, like we, we need to know, don't be embarrassed. Don't feel like you're not doing well. Um, but we need to know so we can keep track. And so we, we make it very clear um, you know, that, that we need, we need to know these things. And, um, yeah, so we, we keep track of everybody pretty closely. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So, um, uh, okay. I forgot the next question I was going to ask you, but, oh, I got it. So you are a journalist, a writer and you're a freelance writer, right? I am. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, so, so life often demands that we reinvent ourselves a little bit, I think. And so that's, that's a great thing you were able to do that. Adaptability is another great word. <laughs> and uh, so could you give us the story behind how you did that and why you did that? Why did you yeah. become a writer? Why did that become the way you make a living? <laughs> Rather than, I know you had at least one other job that I that you might want to mention, I don't know. Yeah, so I actually, I worked in veterinary medicine um, as a veterinary assistant uh, for over 13 years. Um, I ended up in a very specialized position at a, you know, specialty emergency vet. Um, and, you know, I was working in internal medicine. I actually enjoyed a lot of the job itself. Um, you know, I really like a job that will challenge me that will, um, you know, keep that I can kind of continuously learn. Um, there's, <laughs> you know, in veterinary medicine, there's, you can never know everything, um, in any kind of medicine, you can never know everything. And so there's this endless opportunity to learn there. Um, and, you know, I really loved my patients. I loved working with the animals. I liked most of our clients. Um, but the thing about veterinary medicine is that a lot of times it demands that your life kind of be, uh, sur like you make your life about veterinary medicine. Um, you know, it, it kind of consumes you and it's not one of those jobs. It's easy to sort of leave behind at work when you go home. Um, and so you, you end up taking a lot of emotions home with you. And there's a lot of, um, just really sad situations and, um, you know, abuse and you see a lot of pain, you see a lot of suffering. Um, you see, you, you meet with a lot of really sad people and it wears on you after a while. And the, the position that I was in, um, I would frequently work 12 to 14 hour days, sometimes 16 hour days, um, because it, you know, is an emergency vet. And so in life or death situations, I, you're kind of forced to work overtime in those, in those situations. And so I was there a lot and, um, dedicated my life to it. But at some point I, it became too much for me. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard the term compassion fatigue, but it's something that's very real among healthcare workers, um, where you're just, 
you know, you're constantly being compassionate and empathetic towards people. And, um, after a while, it's actually, it, it wears on you to the point where it's hard to continue being compassionate and continue being empathetic. Um, you sort of become bitter. Um, and I saw that happening within myself and I, I really didn't, I didn't like it because I've always been a very empathetic person. Um, I think compassion and empathy are, are so important in, you know, being a, a loving partner, friend, you yeah. know, family member, all of that. And I just, I saw, I saw myself changing and I, I didn't like that. I also, you know, had started participating in these outdoor adventure sports. Like I got into mountaineering, I got into rock climbing, um, you know, lots of backpacking. And I kind of was like, man, I like, I want to dedicate my life to the outdoors. That's where I'm truly happy. That's where I truly feel like myself. That's, it's, you know, that's where I want to be all the time. So I kind of had the shifting in my perspective of my job and, um, the requirements of it where I just didn't feel like I could give myself to that, to that anymore. Um, and so I, I started writing and writing is something that I've always loved doing. I remember an English teacher, um, when I was in high school told me that I needed to go to school to be a journalist. She, she insisted. And I was like, no, I'm going to be a veterinarian. Um, <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, but she was absolutely right. I, you know, maybe I should have gone to school to be a journalist, but um, to have that formal education behind me. But I, I started writing because I, I enjoyed it. Um, I had actually written a business plan for a rock climbing gym um, that I was going to try and open, and that ended up not working out. But because I wrote that business plan, I kind of was like, man, I'm kind of like, I, I can sort of write okay. Um, and so I started writing blogs and then I started writing for other people. Um, I wrote a lot of free stuff for people where I, I didn't get paid. And then I started writing things that, you know, paid me pennies and, and eventually I, I ended up sort of breaking into the outdoor industry as a journalist, a blogger. Um, and I, now I, I write for the outdoor industry. I, and, um, it's one of the best things ever because <laughs> they get to yeah. do the things I love and I get to write about it. Yeah. So, uh, when you write for the outdoor industry, do you just have an idea, you write an article and you submit it or do they say, Hey, we need an article about this. Could you write it? Or do you do both? both. <laughs> yeah, it's both. Sometimes I'll have a, an article idea and I'm like, Oh, that's a perfect fit for, you know, trail runner magazine or, um, Oh, this is a perfect fit for, you know, uh, gnarly nutrition, which is a, the nutrition company that I work with as an athlete. Um, and so I'll pitch article ideas, um, to certain companies kind of based on what they are and, and what it's about. Yeah. So how did you find the free writing opportunities? And then how did you move from that to the opportunities that paid pennies? And then you have a background. Uh, how how did you get that process started? Um, well, so part of that is having a friend who is already a freelance writer. Um, he was a freelance writer in the real estate industry. And so not something that I have any interest in, in writing for, but he knew people was able to introduce me to, to some people, um, to get paid, you know, the pennies pretty much to like get that started as far as finding, uh, you know, places to, to you know, submit articles and blogs for free. Most, most places <laughs> you can do that. Um, you can be, you know, you can find places to be a guest writer. Um, I mean, there's unlimited opportunity there. Um, so, you know, if there's like a certain industry that you're interested in writing for, um, you know, writing article pieces, adventure stuff, um, and then submitting it as a, you know, like free, <laughs> free piece to, to somebody, most of the time they'll accept it. I mean, it's probably not going to get 
you know, printed in outside magazine or something like that. Like that's actually difficult, um, to, to get into, but you know, there's a lot of online blogs that would happily take free, um, submissions. And I think like, I want to say ultra runner magazine, um, oh, yeah. their, their online presence, they, they try, I think it says on their website that they try to, um, post every, almost everything that they get as long as it's in line with their, you know, with their values. And, um, so, you know, that's an easy place to, to get some stuff out there with your name on it, um, at, for free. <laughs> um, you know, I, there's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of publications that'll take free, free stuff and put it online, but yeah, it's just a matter of doing your research, um, and submitting and being willing to take no for an answer. Uh, that happens a lot. And then, you know, as a freelance writer, I actually get, uh, some companies will say yes. And then when it comes down to the wire, they're like, Oh, actually no. (laughs) Um, so that's, that's one thing about any kind of freelancing is, uh, it can be kind of unpredictable. How hard is it to get to the point where you can actually make some kind of a living? It's hard. Um, it's, it was a lot more difficult than I thought it was going to be. I kind of thought that once I, for some reason I had it in my head that once I sort of created this online presence, um, that people would seek me out. Um, and yes, that happens sometimes, but it doesn't happen all the time. And so, um, you kind of have to be able to sort of promote yourself, um, you know, market yourself and reach out to, to, um, publications that you want to be published in. And, um, sometimes you have to adjust your, (laughs) your willingness to, you know, change your fees and stuff like that based on, um, who you're working with. And it, it can be, it can be really, really challenging, um, to get like a continuous, uh, stream of work. And even sometimes, you know, it's like a boom or bust where you're just inundated with tons of work, like lots of writing projects and which is great, but it's also overwhelming. Um, and then you'll have, you know, weeks where there's not much going on and you're like, man, why, why can't I find work? Yeah. Um, and it's- the kind of thing where if somebody wants an article and they want to publish it next month, they, there is a deadline on it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you mentioned uh, bitterness when you were working at and, and a particular uh, compassion burnout, uh, whatever term you use there. But uh, um, compassion fatigue, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, can you go into the bitterness aspect? Because fatigue is different from bitterness. Um, well, I mean, I, the, the compassion fatigue causes the bitterness. Um, I mean, when you are kind of constantly inundated with really sad people, sad cases, um, you know, there were days, I remember there was one day where we did like, just me and the doctor that I worked with, we did like 12 euthanasias. Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of pain and suffering, um, that, that comes along with, with that industry. And, um, you know, when, when you get that sort of fatigue and it's, it's hard to explain unless you've really experienced it. I think, you know, if there are are nurses or other, um, you know, doctors or, or any other veterinary you know, personnel that are listening, like they, they would, they'd get it. Like they understand. Um, but you get to this point where, you know, you, you start hearing people's sad stories, um, you know, about their dogs and, and then, you know, they're already sad. So then they're telling you about their sick family members and you, you, you end up kind of being like a, a counselor, um, to these people who are going, you know, who are having a really hard time, who are very sad, And, um, you know, when you do that for 12 hours a day, every single day, you start getting to the point where you're like, 
yeah, yeah, I've heard it before, you know, okay, yeah, can we move on? I've got more to do. You know, you start kind of going like, Uh, all right, let's, you know, like, let's get the show on the road. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, you're sad, you know, like, and it, it's horrible to say that out loud, but it, it, it happens and it happens to everybody who, who works in that industry and especially the healthcare industry, um, you know, where people are just so overworked, um, that you just, you know, you're tired, your, your body's tired, your mind is tired, and you're just constantly being, you know, inundated with, with sad, sad stories and situations and it, it wears on you and you have to kind of build a callus in order to live day to day in that. And part of that callus is that bitterness. It's, it's that kind of like, okay, yeah, yeah, I get it. Let's move on sort of a thing. Um, yeah, been there, done that. Like, let, so I don't know. It's, it's hard. To, it's hard to explain. No, no uh, it's kind of, you're describing it in terms of kind of a time pressure also, because yeah. we have a lot of people to deal with. And I did work in healthcare. I just wanted you to go into that a little bit and see if we could know what that meant for you. But um, one of the hardest things I had was the time pressure because this person needs attention, but you don't have the time for it. You got to move on to the next one. And then uh, being in that kind of a system really affected me. And then it reflects back to the patient because they think you don't care. And when they say you don't care, that's absolutely not true. And yeah, the whole thing gets to be tough in more ways than one. Yeah. Yeah. And when, you know, when you're working with, with people who are sad and upset, you know, um, it's, it's hard to reason with them sometimes. And so you end up with these like kind of unreasonable, difficult situations. Um, and then you throw in with veterinary medicine, you throw in the monetary aspect. Um, and you know, I, it's frustrating because people, yell at you all the time when you're in veterinary medicine that, oh, you're just doing this for the money um, because they see how, you know, they see their bill, it's expensive. And they think that everybody at the vet is just making tons of money. And that's totally not true. Like even the veterinarians are not making a, a lot of money. Um, it's, it's hard to have people, you know, on the daily um, kind of insult you in that way. And that, you know, you're just doing this yes, for the money yes. when, you literally, the only reason you're doing it is because you do care. (laughs) You know, if I wanted to make a lot of money, I would go do something else. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So it's, it's heartbreaking in that way. Yeah. And, uh, there was a fire that actually was part of the decision. Yeah, that was, um, so the, there's a camp, there was a fire up in Northern California that, it's called the campfire um, that pretty much took out the entire town of Paradise as well as some surrounding small towns. Um, what is that when about that fire, a million acres? Yeah, it's 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 it was devastating and it moved insanely fast. Um, like I had friends who lived in Paradise who almost didn't get out. You know, they were stuck in their vehicles in traffic and. and there's fire just making, you know, like trees falling all over the place and, you know, firestorms all around them. And, um, you know, I have friends who lost their pets, um, up there because they were at work in Chico and the fire rolled through the town and they couldn't get up there to take, to get their pets out of, out of their houses. And so they lost pets. Um, people died. Uh, it was, it was a really, really tragic, um, fire, but because it was so close to Chico and because I, you know, we were the only emergency that in the area, all of the burn patients, like all of the burned animals that were found in paradise, including wildlife, um, were all brought to us because we were the emergency vat were open 24 seven. And so we saw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of burned animals. And, um, 
I think the, the first day of the fire, I worked probably 20 hours because we were just inundated. Um, and that went on for weeks. It was weeks of daily, like animal control would bring in, you know, 20 burned animals at, at one time. And so, you know, we're just, we had these stations of triage and, and treatment. Um, but that, that whole thing kind of put me over the edge, um, when it came to working in the field, I, the, the amount of suffering that we saw at that time was tremendous and overwhelming and it was traumatizing for, for the employees there. Um, and I, I just kind of, that was the thing I, you know, I, don't, I was already kind of thinking like, I need to get out of this industry. Like I'm ready for a change. Um, and then when that happened, that sort of put me over the edge where I was just like, man, I, I don't want to see the suffering anymore. Um, it's, it's too heartbreaking. <laughs> and so, yeah, I just, I, you know, and I just was that, that really made me, made me kind of exit. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was, I was really ready at that point. So in walking through, uh, Northern California and into Oregon, I have on the PCT, I have hiked for a whole day, a whole day at a time, a lot of miles seeing nothing but going through a burned area. So, uh, you've seen the same things, I'm sure. Yeah, there's, um, yeah, the, the amount of California that's been burned is, is pretty insane. And, you know, it's, it's really sad because there's, there's so much burned area now and just old growth forests that are being lost. And it's, it's really sad to see. Um, and, you know, and, uh, purely, um, oh, what's the word? Um, self-centered way, you know, it's, it really gets in the way of a lot of recreation. <laughs> um, you yeah. know, that's the, the fires are, are terrible. Yeah. Well, that, that, that contrast of where we would hope that nature would be there for us <laughs> and then seeing, I think that when you see a, a report on the news and you see some fires and, but you haven't walked through it, you live somewhere away from there. You don't really realize how much, how big those fires are. And, um, I, I, I lived in Fresno for several years and there every single day you see the uh, effect and the, and the visuality of uh, air pollution. And uh, yeah, what, I, I don't know if that, how much we want to go into that, but the, the climate I think is changing and I think that we have responsibility there. So, do you want to comment on that or not? Um, I mean, I, you know, it, it, it affects us all. Um, I think that it definitely feels more immediate if you are living in areas that are, you know, capable of burning or near areas that, that burn like that. Um, it is definitely a little bit more in your face. Um, and it, it feels much more obvious that there's, you know, climate change and that this is definitely has gotten worse over the years. And even, you know, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm super young, but I'm also, you know, haven't been around that long. And, um, you know, in my lifetime, I've seen an increase in, in the fires, um, and the number of fires and the size of the fires. Um, so yeah, I just, it's, it's so hard because yes, we have responsibility, but again, you know, I, I don't know what we're going to do immediately. That's going to make a big difference. Um, but I, I also can't say, you know, that I'm very well read, um, in the subject or that I keep up with anything. Um, you know, I just, it, it, I just know that it affects us all and it is kind of an immediate, uh, thing that needs to be dealt with. Yeah, I think so too. It's more serious than we think. Yeah. So uh, I'll ask you one more quick question about your writing. How, how long did it take you after you made a transition 
to writing from your uh, work in veterinary medicine, how long did it take you before you began to have a little bit of a living? What, what was the time period there? Um, well, initially, it actually felt like it it was kind of starting pretty fast. Like I, I left my job at the vet at the end of August in 2019. Um, so not long before, you know, the thick of the pandemic. And I actually, by that fall, um, or, you know, by December, I actually was kind of like, wow, I'm, you know, I'm doing, this is, I'm doing pretty well. This is actually supporting me. Um, and then the pandemic hit, um, and I actually lost some contracts because of that. Um, so, you know, a lot of places were losing money. Um, I, they just couldn't afford to, you know, keep some of their freelancers on. And so I lost out on some contracts, um, and my work pretty much became non-existent at that point. So the, the, you know, 2020 was kind of really rough. (laughs) Um, it was, I did not have a lot of income. Um, I was really lucky in that I was able to get rid of my apartment. I was staying with a friend for free. Um, so I didn't have a lot of responsibility as far as bills went at that point. Um, and you know, I was just really lucky in that, you know, my, my partner, my boyfriend, he was very, very supportive in that time. And, you know, uh, instead of me trying to get out there and find a job during pandemic when nobody could find a job, um, I was able to kind of focus and, um, you know, develop my skills and work on my podcast, um, and sort of get that community up and running. Um, and then, yeah, so it was probably a, a good solid six to eight months before I was able to start finding work again. Okay. What about the challenges and the frustrations and, uh, and, success in, uh, in that journey <laughs> was it, uh, it was frustrating and it was, it was frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Especially since, you know, when I first left my, my vet job, I felt like, you know, things were going really well. And I felt like I was going to be able to, uh, you know, make a pretty good living off of, you know, writing for people and, I just felt like it was snowballing. And then all of a sudden it came to a screeching halt. And, you know, there's a lot of frustration in that because it's, it's like, well, you know, you don't know, is it ever going to come back? Um, and so that was, that was really tough because I started thinking to myself, well, maybe this, maybe this writing thing isn't for me, <laughs> you know, maybe I need to find something else to do. And, um, I do at that point, I was already kind of addicted to the, <laughs> the freedom, um, of that kind of lifestyle where, you know, I could choose to work or choose not to, and I could make my own schedule throughout the day. And, you know, that that's very, it's really nice for somebody like me who, you know, thrives in getting outside and moving my body every day, um, and being able to, you know, pick when and where I get to do that is, you know, the best thing ever. And so, um, yeah, I just, I, I did want to stick with it and kind of see what happened. And it's, it's starting to pick up steam a little bit more now, um, which is, which has been a relief, but also kind of, um, gratifying and that, you know, like I stuck with it. I've, you know, I've worked really hard. I'm, I'm, you know, trying really hard to make this work. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's got a lot of perks for sure. (laughs) Uh, very similar in some ways to your FKTs. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So what word of advice or hope do you have for someone who needs to reinvent themselves? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Cause I I feel like there's a lot that can be said there, but um, I would say that, you know, anything is possible. If you, if you want to make a change in your life, you can make a change in your life. If you feel like you're stuck in a job, you're never really stuck in a job. Um, you know, if you want to 
start living in a van and, and live the van life, there are steps that you can take to make that happen. You just have to have to really want it. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to, you know, reinventing your life, like nothing, that nothing is out of, out of line. Nothing is impossible. Um, and especially now with, with all of the like work from home opportunities that there are, um, there's a, a lot of different ways that you can kind of, um, you know, shape the path that you're on. What, what would be the biggest mistake people might make in trying to reinvent their life? Uh, what would be a, a way to, uh, using the word in kind of a positive way, but what would be a way that they could fail at it? Ooh. Um, I mean, it depends on... <laughs> It, it depends on, on what you consider is, you know, a huge mistake. I, I feel like I've made a lot of mistakes, but coming out the other side, I always feel like I'm a better person for it. Um, I mean, I'll be totally honest with you. And this is the first time that I've said this in, you know, a public context, but, um, I, I had to file for bankruptcy at one point. Um, and that was one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. You know, I, I got divorced. I, you know, was living off of credit cards and, um, got to a point where I was like, I can't, you know, I, I can't keep living like this if I'm going to live, if I want to live a certain way, um, you know, cause I was just working to pay off debt and, you know, unable to live my life in any joyful kind of way because yeah. of that. Um, and so it was like, well, the only way to change that is to, is to file for bankruptcy. And so that I can like sort of start fresh. Um, and so that, you know, that's something that I've, that I've had to do in my life. And most people will look at that and be like, well, you failed, you know, like that's a big mistake. And I'm kind of like, that's yeah. one of the best decisions I ever made. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Came out of it with truer values. Yeah. 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 Cool. Very cool. Um, so yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do that could be considered a mistake. You know, like you could foreclose on your house. You could, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that could happen. I can identify um, with a lot of that too. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think the, the thing that I ask myself a lot when I'm making decisions is if I don't do this, am I going to regret it? Like, will I regret not doing something? not trying. Um, and that has really shaped a lot of my decision-making. Um, and you know, the, the van life, the leaving the vet, a lot of the mountaineering objectives, um, a lot of the big adventures that I've done, I've, you know, I've, a I've asked myself, will I regret not doing this? If I choose not to do this, will I regret it? If the answer is like, yeah, I'm going to do it most people on their deathbed, they, re they don't regret things that they did. They regret things that they didn't get to do. And yeah. I don't want that. I want to do, I want to live my life. Um, I don't want to regret not trying something when I had the chance to try it. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that's a, that's a huge part of the decision-making process for me. And, and because I, <laughs> because of, uh, my different view on failure, I think that I'm a little bit more willing to, take on certain risks because, because, you know, if I fail, then what, 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 what am I going to get out of that? Well, I'm going to get some really good lessons. That's right. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's like a, a huge part of my, uh, how I live my life these days, Yeah. <laughs> which yeah. some people might see that and be like, that's irresponsible. Um, but you know, I, I can't help, but just really want to live life while I can. We, we have the power to make a change. We just have to get out there and be curious and experiment and, uh, and see where that takes us. Yeah. It, it will take us somewhere. Yeah. And um, so you had a beautiful post on Facebook not too long ago, because I know you like to be on your feet. You like to be setting these FKTs. I'd even like to revel in some more stories of those but you, you like to be like all of us do. You like to be flowing through the mountains and, and uh, not injured. But 
here on Okanagan, you got COVID. Um, having a painful uh, rib is no fun. And uh, the year previous, I believe you had an injury that set you back several months. And so you had a beautiful post about finding the silver lining in those things and adapting to life now, can you give us a little bit about uh, from that post? Yeah, um, I, it's something that I've been thinking. I, well, because of my injury from last year, I had a lot of time to think about, you know, how can I try and stay positive about this? Because no athlete likes to be injured. Nobody likes to be injured, period. But when you're an athlete and you can't do the things that you want to do and you can't do the things you love to do, um, or even the things that you're paid to do sometimes it's, it, it, it's demoralizing and, um, you know, it's, it's hard as an athlete to sit and be injured and not be able to do the things that you, that you love to do, like running and climbing and, and stuff like that. So, you know, how can I take this experience and, uh, spin it in a positive way? Well, you know, recently I've been spending more time with friends. I've been, you know, nurturing those hobbies like, you know, art and reading and, and stuff like that and creative writing that I didn't allow myself to nurture before. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of really positive things that I can see from this. Um, you know, I, I am more aware of my self-care and my, you know, when I'm done with a workout, I'm going to take better care of myself. I'm going to use that foam roller. I'm going to, you know, like, I, I think that because of these injuries, I'm hoping the plan is to, you know, come out of this a stronger athlete, but also a more well-rounded person. Um, and so it's, it's been kind of nice being able to focus on, on those other things and kind of go, okay, you know, I'm not just a runner. I'm a lot of different things and I have a lot of different, you know, cool things going on in my life and amazing friends. And, you know, I, I want to, I want to nurture those aspects of myself. Yeah. So it's been said that we're put on this earth to do creative work and that's, you are getting a little bit more time to do some of that. Charlie always happens when you get injured, you get a chance to slow down and maybe discover things that you wouldn't have even had time to, to do that are part of yourself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then the other thing about strength, I was just recently had the real privilege of interviewing Mark Allen, six-time world Ironman champion. And he said, I didn't win all those Ironmans because I got really good at training. I won all those Ironmans because I got really good at organizing my life and, uh, and discussing strength too. Strength comes, yeah, the battles all the, the most important battles are always inside and strength comes from when you can be still. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. And I, I can, I can agree with him about, you know, organizing your life because, you know, as a freelancer, I can pretty much organize my life however I want, as far as like my daily and, you know, organizing it in a way where you, <laughs> you have the time to, um, you know, put into all of the things that matter that make you a well-rounded person that make you strong, that make you, um, fast that, you know, it's, it, it's challenging, but it's also, I think it's probably one of the most important things you can do. If you can organize your life and make space for those things, yep. um, you're more likely to succeed. Absolutely. And, uh, it's something that, uh, you know, I've, I've been in health and fitness, long time but uh i'm retired now but from that that type of thing anyway but uh the other thing is people are quite obsessed with flexibility but flexibility i think the the most important aspect of flexibility is what you make it into adaptability <laughs> so yeah being able to adapt and, and find those those good things the the quality in life yeah. So I'm going to ask you what I think is a really cool question for you, because I think that you could have a lot of input on it. So what is your purpose? My purpose? Yeah. 
And that, that kind of leads into something else. <laughs> that's a, I mean, that's such a big question, you know, um, but I, I, I think my purpose is to leave this world a better place to, you know, make the people around me better people, um, to inspire others to live their best lives. Um, I mean, there's, I think there's, a, a, I don't think there's any one purpose that, you know, we're put on this earth to do. If, if you want to think about it that way, I think that there's a lot of purpose to life. Um, and I think that you can find purpose in almost anything, but, you know, I, I think the most important thing that we can do is, is leave the world a better place. And I think in order to leave the world a better place, you have to, um, find what you're passionate about and then, you know, sort of pour yourself into that. And so, you know, if it's, if it's art, you know, the world needs art, you know, it needs creativity, like pour yourself into that. You're, you're going to leave the world a better place. Um, you know, if, if your passion is working out, if your passion is health, um, fitness, like pour yourself into that, you can inspire people, um, you know, you can reach anybody in the world now, pretty much the, yeah. the internet's an amazing place. Yes, um, yeah. and so, yeah, I think that, you know, as far as purpose goes, you know, leave the world a better place by pouring yourself into what you love. I, I really like the way you put that because you put it in a universal sense and it absolutely is that I think, um, sometimes you do things. You have no idea why you did them, except that you just did want to do something good in the world. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, and then you also you drew it into the individual aspect too, because everybody has something that they can pull themselves into, or several things. Yeah. So, uh, with that question, I thought maybe that might lead into your podcast, uh, in which you, what would you say, you encourage. Um, women to be themselves in the outdoors how how tell us about your podcast yeah so my podcast is called women of the wild um it's kind of always a work in progress <laughs> um but the podcast aims to inspire and, and kind of educate more women to get outside um do cool things in the outdoors and it serves as kind of a place where you can learn um share stories um, you know, I, I just want to see more women participating in the outdoors. And I think to do that, we need to kind of make it more accessible. Um, and to make it more accessible, we need, you know, to, to get the women who are out there doing things to tell their stories and, and, you know, help educate. Um, and so women of the wild is, something that I started just to kind of like, look, you know, there's all these cool women out there doing cool things. Like, and, you know, they didn't all start when they were kids, you know, some of them got started, you know, later in life and, you know, are, are making their way now in their forties and fifties. And it, it's like, there's so much that you can do and so much that's possible. Um, and yeah, I just, I just want to see more women out there doing, doing things like that. Um, there's like a, there's a huge gap in, there's a huge gender gap in the amount of men who participate in outdoor adventure sports and the amount of women. And I just want to see that gap kind of shrink a bit. Um, you know, as a woman who does solo things in the outdoors, when I'm alone on a mountain, um, you know, doing my own thing, I will often get asked by other by men, um, you know, where's your partner? Do you know what you're doing? You know, I'm, it's kind of like always questioned. And I'm like, I don't have a partner. Where's your partner? Do you know what you're doing? Um, you know, it's, 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 it's frustrating, um, as a woman to kind of always get that, that, uh, feedback that, you know, I don't know what I'm doing because I'm a woman. Oh, I have to have a partner. Um, because I'm a woman, you know, I'm not capable of doing things on my own or, um, not strong enough or whatever. You know, there's so many reasons that, that people think that feel that women aren't capable in the outdoors. And so that's, that's something that I, I seek to change. Um, 
because honestly, I, I, not to, you know, toot my own horn, but I feel like I'm more capable than a lot of people, um, in the outdoors and in the yeah. mountains and, and yeah. um, you know, to have my experience and, and knowledge question based on my gender is the, one of the most maddening things in the world. Um, so yeah, I think in, in order to see those kinds of comments and dialogues, um, start to disappear. We need to see more women in the outdoors doing these things and, you know, make it common and, and make it just as common as, you know, as, as the men who are out there and, you know, um, to do that, I, I just want to, I want to inspire and educate more women to, to go after those things. Um, so that's, yeah, and you are, <laughs> that's, and that's, that's sort of what the podcast. Podcast. Do you think That's what the uh, podcast seems to do? You think the gap is closing? Do I think it? Um, yeah. yeah, I think so. I yeah. think that um, you know the outdoors is starting to become more accessible to minorities, and um, you know I see a lot of like really amazing women's adventure groups and and you know adventure groups that are focused on people of color um, to, to get more diversity in the outdoors. And that's been really, really amazing to watch. Um, and actually the Aconcagua expedition that we had was a, a, an all women's team through all expeditions, which is, a uh, all women's expedition, big mountain expedition, um, company. And it, it's just, it's really amazing to see these, these things come about. And I do think there's a lot of work to do still, but I, I also think that, you know, change is happening. Um, yeah. and, and the outdoors is becoming much more diverse and much more accessible. Yeah. So it's a good time. Yeah, it's, it's a good time. Um, I mean, I, you know, I'd like to see it change more. Um, you know, there's a lot of high poverty inner city people who could benefit from some dose of, you know, trails near their homes and stuff like that. And, you know, that's, that's a whole nother issue. Um, but yeah, I think that, I think that we're, we're on our way to making a difference. Yeah. So Ashley, uh, where can people listen to your podcast? Where can they read your blogs? Where can they read your writing and whatever else you would like to tell people about, uh, yeah. Um, so the podcast is available on pretty much any, uh, platform where you get podcasts. Um, so it's on Apple podcasts, it's on Spotify, it's, it's all over everything. Like I got it. I tried to get it onto every podcasting platform. So it's women of the wild, um, hosted by me, Ashley Winchester. Um, I am working on the website. I'm actually revamping the website, but when that's up and running, that's womenofthewild.org. And um, as far as me personally, my Instagram is probably the best way to follow along and, and get a hold of me. I'm not great on Facebook or Facebook Messenger. I tend to not answer those. Um, I don't allow a lot of social medias to, um, give me notifications on my phone. So, um, Instagram is, is my social media of choice. And that is just my name, Ashley dot Winchester. Um, and I'm pretty responsive on there, um, and post fairly regularly. Um, you can find me on Facebook. I'm just not on it very often. It's Ashley Winchester. And then, um, Oh, as far as the writing goes, I do write regularly for Athletic Brewing Company, um, which is a non-alcoholic beer. Um, they're really incredible. Highly recommend them. But um, I also write for other outdoor <laughs> companies. I've written for, you know, the Sawyer Water Filters, um, written a couple of things for Gnarly Nutrition. Um, usually when I write something, I will post it on my Instagram, um, and in my, my link tree on my Instagram. So there's, uh, some articles that you can find there. If you're interested, I am working on getting another personal blog set up. Um, that's in the works, um, trying to make more room in my life to write my personal adventures and in, in on my blog. So 
that'll that'll be up and running at some point, but <laughs> not quite yet. Okay. Yeah, I'll put some of those uh, links up here in the description. And how do you keep up with your podcast when you're out uh, doing your adventures? Oh man, I don't. That's like one of the things that I need to get better about, and actually, I'm, I'm working on. Um, I so I've taken a couple of big breaks from the podcast. One of which was just this last year. I took like six months off from the podcast and kind of trying to reevaluate sort of the goals and my goals and making sure that the podcast was still sort of like in line with what I want to do and, and what I aim to achieve. Um, and found that I actually really love doing the podcast and I love talking to other women and, and, you know, like kind of creating those relationships with them. And so I decided to continue the podcast, got back on the podcast role and then got really sick. Um, you know, on Aconcagua. Um, so yeah, it's been a couple months since I've put out an episode just because I couldn't quite, well, I was on Aconcagua for a month, but, um, you know, I couldn't quite, uh, yeah, get so my this, head back in a place where I could do interviews. So, so this um, is a chance for people to catch up on some of the episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Go, go binge those episodes. And I actually, um, trying to get some people lined up to release an episode in March, um, do some interviews and stuff. So trying to get the podcast back up and rolling again. Um, yeah. but so, yeah, I'm, I'm just like, not very good at doing it while I'm out on adventures. <laughs> would you like to leave our listeners with any, uh, final words? Uh, final words. Um, <laughs> it sounds so cliche and silly, but chase your dreams. Um, <laughs> yeah. no, I, I, I think, I think it's important to find the things you're passionate about and apply yourself and make sure that you make room in your life for those things. Um, and you know, one of the ways that I got into running and, you know, being an athlete is that I fell in love with it and I fell in love with the process. And, you know, I had a lot of people tell me that I would never be a runner and that I would never be good at running. And, um, you know, I, I just ignored them because I loved it so much. And, you know, here I am with 53 FKTs and, um, you know, kind of making, making it such a part of my life that, you know, I can, you know, now I'm able to be a guest on some cool podcasts and, yeah. you know, like, um, and be able to inspire people with it. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, making space for the things that you love, even if, even if it doesn't seem like a priority, I think prioritize it and see where it can take you. And somewhere along the line, the universe will meet you in that and, and it will become some kind of a reality, maybe not exactly what you thought at first, but, but close and it would really be cool. Yeah. Well, at the very least, it'll bring you joy, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Ashley, thank you so much. I, I really had fun with this, really enjoyed it, really appreciate it. Thank you. It was, it was a pleasure being on.